All right. Okay. So let's talk about self storage investing and let's talk about um, how you can get started. All right. This is what everybody wants to know. Right? So everybody's newbies here. Um, okay. There are five ways for you to, there are five different ways for you to invest in self storage. All right. We're going to go over those right now. Um, the five ways. So we'll go over those. We'll go over those all uh, as we're as I'm teaching. Okay. So the first one is mismanaged properties. Mismanaged properties. So all of you rehabbers out there and, and wholesalers. All right. You all. Um, you all. Uh, you already know. Like you just go buy dumpy storage facilities, right? And now when I say a mismanaged facility. I, I mean one that's like 25 to 50% full. It's not being managed properly, okay? And, uh, and so you're going to what's called value add that property, okay? So you're gonna take it from like being 25 to 50% full to getting it to 90% full, okay? And uh, so that's number one. Number two is income producing properties. Income producing. This is cash flowing properties. These are properties that are running great. They're probably like 75% full or fuller. You know, a lot of them are like 90%, 100% full. And um, and uh, and you're and all you and what's going to be awesome about these is that you can get a P and L and a balance sheet, and you can get tax returns, and then you can take that information to a local bank or to get an SBA loan, and you can borrow that money at like super low interest rates. Okay, whereas a mismanaged facility. Right, nobody's gonna lend you money on that. No bank is gonna lend you money. So you're gonna have to go to a private lender or like a hard money lender or something like that and borrow from somebody that you know or partner or something like that. Because they do, these do not have P and L and, and balance sheets or anything like this. In fact, they're mostly like we have, I have a student right now, he's buying a $1.6 million facility, 1.6 million, and it was a cash only business. Cash only. That's it. Can you imagine a $1.6 million company that was cash only? All right. So, um, and he's, and, and so he, his tax return is like, he said, you know, they have to, he's buying that facility based off the owner's tax return. And the tax return doesn't show a lot of income. Right. So the, what the owner is saying is that essentially it's worth way more than one point six million dollars, except for he just can't prove that. So our goal as a storage facility owner is to not be that owner. OK, is your goal is to not be the storage facility that I want to buy in the next couple of years. Right. So we are going to run our businesses properly. Gone are the days where you take uh, credit I and mean, sorry, you where you take check and cash. In fact, our storage facilities are completely contactless, completely virtual. And we've been that way since the very beginning. So, you know, we were like way ahead of our time before COVID came. OK, there is no reason for you to have to meet your tenants. You can do everything online or by the phone now and set it up and automate it that way. OK, but this owner of this it's almost 300 unit facility got up every day, drove to his storage facility, which was right around the corner and uh, worked his business seven days a week. And he had notepads where he was keeping track of everything. He had no online software at all, nothing. And in fact, he only took cash. And then he just, he, he said he pocketed most of that money. That would be a mismanaged facility, okay? That would be a mismanaged facility. In fact, we ran numbers on that. And the opportunity value of that facility is like $3.2 million. And he's getting it for $1.6 million, okay? All right, income producing is like, you know, when you when you meet somebody that has is an income producing property and they have their P&L on their balance sheet, guess what? They wanna show that to you. 
They're like, oh yeah, I wanna get the highest amount of value if I possibly can get, okay? So they're gonna pull out their tax return, they're gonna pull out their P&L, they're gonna pull out their, their balance sheet because they wanna show you and they wanna get the most amount of value and they want the bank to appraise that at the highest value, okay? So a lot of times with income producing pro properties, it's different from a mismanaged property. A mismanaged property is really based on opportunity cost and value add, okay? So and essentially like all the properties that we buy, we buy all mismanaged facilities. And our goal is within like the next three to five years to double that value, right? That's our goal. And that's kind of what we look at, all right? An income producing property, most of the time, it's you're going to be basing your numbers off of the income that's already coming in, right? And it's a business that you're buying. And then sometimes there's some value add, like maybe you can raise the rates or you can build on and add more units. There's more land that you can add and, and add the value on. But when you run your numbers, you're basing it on that as is cost, right? So this would be as is, and this is value add or opportunity cost. That's the difference between both of those, okay? And then you also have um, you also have new construction. Number three, new construction. There is not enough storage facilities in the world. Now, maybe if you're living in these major metropolitan areas, they're oversaturated. So for instance, like Austin, Texas, like you don't wanna be building in Austin, Texas. There's way too much. All these metro areas, they're all like those are you, you don't you don't need to be focusing on that anyways. You want to focus on secondary and tertiary markets. Okay, secondary and tertiary markets. So the way that um, the way that the market looks in the storage facility world is you have your primary market, your secondary market, and your tertiary markets. Okay, so this is primary. And your cap rate for a primary market is going to be between five and seven percent. Okay. Now, this is nothing like this is commercial real estate, but actually, storage facilities are considered warehouses. Okay. So, this is not like you don't know, like how many doors do you got? This is not like multifamily. Multifamily is calculated completely different than storage facilities. All right, so storage facilities are considered warehouses, all right? And commercial, commercial is like kind of a, a weird way of looking at commercials. You've got like retail commercial, you've got multifamily commercial, and then you've got like warehouse commercial, right? Or industrial, it's like industrial commercial, kind of. It's like, it's kind of how you look at it. And they're all kind of, they're calculated in the same respect, and then, but like they're different as well too, okay? It's just so you know, just give an idea. So in the markets, you have five to 7% cap rate in the primary market. This is self-storage, remember. In your secondary markets, you got an eight to 9% cap rate. Okay, this is cap rate. Yeah, my, um, my handwriting is horrible, sorry y'all. Okay, and my, uh, my, uh, uh, the third market is the ter tertiary markets. And this is like a 10 plus cap. Okay, now cap rate, all it is, is risk level, risk level. You don't want any risk, you go into a five to 7% cap rate and you know you're gonna make money, right? Might not be a lot of value add, but you're gonna make that monthly income every single month, but it just costs more, it costs more money here. And then the secondary market, so, and this would be like, for instance, I live in Atlanta, like the Atlanta, I live in the North Georgia mountains, but I live like the Atlanta area. And Atlanta would be considered a primary market, right? Inside the perimeter of Atlanta would be like the primary market. Outside of the perimeter of Atlanta would be a secondary market, but maybe a primary market, maybe, you know, because like, you know, competition is starting to grow, right? So that might be, that primary market might be bigger in the Atlanta area. And it really depends on which, city you're talking about whether or not you're in a primary, secondary, or tertiary market, okay? So primary, and then we have secondary, and then tertiary is like out in the country, all right? Secondary be like the burbs, right? The burbs, okay? So if you're, if I'm talking about a smaller city, like I'm talking about like Augusta, Georgia, 
Augusta, like, you know, it's like 75, I think it's like seven, how many, I don't know what the population of Augusta is. I'm guessing it's like 75,000, okay? Maybe it's more, who knows? But essentially that primary market of Augusta is a smaller primary market versus Atlanta, but there is a primary market, okay? And because it's a big city, so obviously there's a primary market, okay? And then the secondary market would be like the burbs of Augusta, which is probably way bigger than that primary market, okay? And then the tertiary market is like, you know, all the country around or in the middle and between the next city is the tertiary market, right? And so you wanna think about your area and where you live, right? Or do you live, I put it in the chat, do you live in a primary market, a secondary market, or a tertiary market? Can you put that into the chat for me and let me know, um, you know, what, uh, what you guys are into? We've got a lot of primary markets, we've got secondary, or if you guys like, I have no idea, then you know, you can put that as well too. Yeah, so San Diego, definitely a primary market. California is going to be like, if you want to get into self-storage investing, you've got to have some money. All right. So like I have students that live in, in like in California and they do not invest in California. OK, they invest in like outside of California. OK, so, you know, just California expensive. That's just how it is. Right. So all the northeast up there, like I have a student in a Baltimore, Maryland that just bought a storage facility in the five fingers of New York and like one of those little five fingers areas. Right. So a couple hours, you know, up that way, not too far. The good thing with storage facilities is that you could really be anywhere in the United States or world and run your storage facilities. And this is something that I prove to my students all the time because my husband and I, we travel at least six to eight months out of the year. Last year, we traveled eight months. We did four months, a road trip, four months. And um, we did 16 national parks in 16 weeks. And then we went to Tampa for a month. And then we went to Maine for two months, all right? So if when you, uh, when you start getting into owning these facilities, your job is to make sure that you make that completely passive. Don't become the storage facility owner that I want to buy in the next couple of years. Create actual passive wealth, right? We're going to, everyone said, I want passive income. I want passive wealth. Well, it's not passive if you're going to get up every single morning and drive to it and work on and work there every single day. So passive wealth means like automate, systematize, and make it contactless and electronic and be able to manage it from wherever in the world, okay? Um, and once you join REI USA and become a member of REI USA, you're gonna come to this meeting every single month. And then as we go through, you'll start learning more and more and more about stealth storage investing, right? You'll be able to learn, you know, we'll dig deeper into how to analyze the deals, you know, how to look, you know, how to find them, how to fund them, all this kind of stuff, right? So, um, so that's kind of how REI USA works. So you show up every single month and I'll be able to teach you a little bit more and more and more every single month, okay? But we got a lot of secondary markets, not a lot of tertiary markets, right? I focus mostly on tertiary markets and a little bit on secondary markets. And the reason why is because I buy mismanaged facilities with private money. Okay, so when I go and I ask somebody for money, like, would you, hey, do you have any money that I could borrow? Most of the time, people only have a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? So they're not like, they don't have like a million dollars. And in fact, they don't want to like, I don't know you. I'm not going to give you a million dollars. I'm not going to give you my first time I ever loaned you. I'm not going to just hand over, you know, $800,000 or whatever, right? Even though they do have it, because I started out with many private lenders that said, yes, I'll give you $300,000. And now we have like, you know, $2 million together and on in different facilities. Okay. But, but so, but, but private lenders, essentially, they only want to give you so much money. So I have $300,000 and I say, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a facility for $300,000. Well, guess what, where, guess where you find facilities for $300,000. It's not in a secondary market and it's definitely not in a primary market. Most of the time it's in a tertiary market. Okay, so you're gonna have to be out in the country, out in these towns. Now, in the, uh, in the uh, storage investing world, what you're gonna wanna look at, right? And we'll get back to my five ways. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about that. But what you're gonna wanna look at in the storage investing world, okay? is the population 
It's all about population. And then you want to start, you want to be a storage nerd, right? Then you start talking the lingo. And the lingo is what's your total square footage? Right? But also the total square footage of a five mile radius, right? So this is like a three to five mile radius. I would say like primary and secondary, it'd be like a three mile radius and a, and a tertiary, it'd be like a five mile radius, something like that. You know, it might be a secondary, it might be a five mile radius. The secondary is like, there ain't a lot of people there. You know what I'm saying? So population divided by um, total square footage. All right. So, and that's going to tell you whether or not it's a good deal. Now, that's a very quick analysis, right? That's not how you actually truly run your numbers. You have to learn commercial deal analysis. You have to really learn how to run your numbers. That's the hardest part is learning how to figure out if it's a good deal. All right. But, uh, but anyways, population divided by total square footage. Okay. So how do you figure out the population of a five mile at radius, right? You got to figure that out. So you got to you got to figure out how you can do that, right? There's a softwares or like you can Google it or whatever, and then you have the total square footage, okay? And then you have to figure out how many storage facilities are in that mile range. Now that seems like that would be an easy peasy lemon squeezy thing to do, but it's not, okay? All right, because guess what? You're going to go online, boop, 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 boop. I want to buy a storage facility in like Waxahachie, you know, Texas or whatever. And you look up the population, the population is like 5,000 people. And then you count all the storage facilities on Google and you calculate the store, you calculate the total square footage and you divide it by, you know, divide that number, right? Something like that. This is what people do, okay? But the truth of the matter is, is that as many storage facilities that you see online, right, under like Google Maps or whatever, there's going to be the same amount of facilities not online, okay? And that is called, to me, that's called the hidden market, the hidden market, okay? The hidden market. So now what that means, is that you've got to be able to find those storage facilities that are not on Google Maps, okay? All right, so that's the question is how do you find those? How do you find those? And so we'll get into that. We'll get into that a little later, but so, but I wanted to let you know, quick calculation. The answer to this is between six and eight dollars per square foot. If it's a six to eight dollar per square foot, that would be like, yeah, it's a good deal. Below or, or higher would be like not a good deal. So in the self-storage investing world, you have to be able to, you have to understand and look for populations and really try to hone in on which size towns or cities you can afford. All right, which towns and cities you can afford. All right, and so, and that's number one. And then number two is you have to take the total square footage of that town and try to divide it by the population to see if it comes into a six and eight. Is it a good area to be in or not, right? To be investing in or not, that's the question. Is it a good area to be investing in or not? I'm going to go within a five mile radius. I'm going to figure out the population of that area. I'm going to figure out the total square footage of the area. I'm going to divide that and see if it comes into six, point, six to eight. If it does become six to eight, I'm going to focus on that area. And either I'm going to talk to all the owners in that area and try to get them to sell to me, right? Or I'm going to build. I'm going to build. If there is availability to build, then build, right? So we're going back to the new construction here. And uh, you'll notice in the tertiary markets, especially in the tertiary markets, 
um, there is there is a lot of opportunity to build right now. All right, so all of our storage facilities are um, in tertiary, pretty much in tertiary markets, and uh, we're full. We're full. Right, there's like wait lists. Okay, except for the one that we just bought, and just bought. That one's not full because it's a mismanaged property. But other than that, everything that we have is a wait list. Okay. So if you have the stomach to build, has anybody done any new construction here? Uh, I just like to know if anybody's done new construction, houses or anything like that, put it into the chat. New construction is a lot of work. If everybody knows you've done new, yeah, there's a lot of people in here doing new construction. Good. Your new construction is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time and a lot of upfront money right? You got to borrow that money. Okay. So, okay, good. People built their houses, home builders. Good. Awesome. Okay. So if you have the money to build, which means you will go to a local bank and you will get a loan and the loan is a new construction loan, right? And uh, you will put 20% down and it will be like 4% interest for 20 years, like a totally awesome loan. And then you will take, now you will take the next two to three years to build that sucker because that's just how long it takes. Okay. Now, um, the, if you do want to do new construction, if you're interested in new construction, say, yes, I'm interested. Then what you're going to do is you're going to have to, you're going to have to find the piece of property, the land, right? That's number one. It's like, and a lot of people, I could, people come to me all the time. It's like, oh, I got the perfect property to do land or right, to do a storage facility. I got the perfect land, right? So you're going to um, buy the property, right? You have to, then you have to go, you have to um, go to the county and make sure, first of all, go to the county and make sure that you can build, right? Make sure the city or the county or whatever it is that you can build and you can, and it's zoned properly, right? So is it zoned industrial? Most of the time it's industrial, we're, we're considered industrial. Is it zoned industrial? If it's not, can you rezone it to industrial? If it's residential, a lot of times you can't rezone it to anything, right? So, um, so you want to go to the county, talk to the county, get any kind of test, environmental grading, soils, feasibility studies, all the things that you have to do. And that just, all of that just takes time, just takes a lot of time and effort and my upfront money because it costs like feasibility studies could cost five to 10 grand. Your soil testing costs like five grand or whatever, you know, so you got to just have this upfront money plus the land costs money. So anyway, so, but if you can afford that, if you can get a loan, if you're, you have good credit and you have some money to put down, highly recommend just considering new construction because I'm telling you, I'm seeing it in my, my students are doing this and then they are baking. I just talked to one person um, that borrowed $500,000, all right? Built 150 units, took them three years to build. You know, and some counties take longer than others. Took three years, years to build, starting to get it all there, 25% full. They just finished in the last couple of months, 25% full. So it's growing, it's filling up very, very quickly. And, um, they got it appraised. They wanted to know like, what is this gonna be worth when it's 100% full? And it appraised at $1.5 million. So they, they are borrowing $500,000 and they're gonna make a million dollars off of that. It's just insane what you can make with the new construction, okay? So that's why I love new construction and I'm also looking into new construction, um, you know, over, and down the road as well, okay? So new construction is number three. All right, if you can afford it. Number four is conversions and developing. Conversion. Conversions and developing. Okay, so this is like taking old warehouses, like, you know, downtown warehouses in the middle of the cities and converting them to storage, taking like, like one of my students has a, um, is buying an old blockbuster building. The, uh, the guy, the guy that owns it now, can have, he bought it as a blockbuster building and then converted it into climate storage. Okay, and he's buying that. And um, so that is like that, I'm telling you, this is also very, very popular right now. And you can get these retail buildings, y'all know this because commercial retail is going down the dumps right now. You can get those buildings for very, very, very little money, 
all right? And over the course of the next year, it's gonna just keep dropping for those, okay? So if you do have upfront money and you wanna do a conversion, I highly recommend that you learn how to do that as well too, because those will be very, very, and those are also like, it's a new construction. So you'll be able to, um, to really make a lot of money on that in the back end, right? Okay, conversions. And then finally, the fourth way, I mean, the fifth way is wholesaling. Wholesaling self-storage. Does anybody here wholesale? I think I saw like one person wholesale. Who wholesales here? Um, I do good. Yes. Okay, good. Wendy does. Okay, good. We got a couple of people that are wholesaling. Awesome. Okay, Calvin. Awesome. Good. Now, wholesaling commercial is like not the same as wholesaling residential. Wholesaling residential is like you go, you put a house on the property, you get the address, and then you text the address to somebody and say, do your own due diligence. Okay, but wholesaling on the commercial side is completely different. So we, the buyers, I'm a buyer, I expect a wholesaling package, right? So you can't just give me an address and say, hey, I think I get, you know, this, this deal might be good. All right, you have to put together a, like a pro forma, a package, you have, to, you have to spice it up and wine and dine all these buyers because we in the self-storage investing world, we spoil. We spoiled, right? Okay. So uh, wholesaling, if anybody doesn't know what wholesaling is, I highly recommend that you join REI USA and you start going to our wholesaling training, right? Once you learn how to wholesale, you can wholesale anything. You can, uh, Mike wholesales um, land, right? We have, a, we have a Mike Watkins teaches wholesaling. He teaches every week. So if you want to learn how to wholesale, then definitely go to his trainings, all right? But what, ha what happens in, when you wholesale self-storage is that um, the reason I love it so much is that you just make so much money. So my, one of my students right now is buying, a, buying a, a storage facility. It's a 300, like almost 300 unit storage facility for $1.6 million. And he's buying it from a wholesaler, okay? The property itself is $1.5 million. And his wholesaler that is, is making $150,000 on that transaction. $150,000. All right, one transaction. Okay. So wholesaling, I wholesale the property just a while back, made like 65 grand on it. All right. So wholesaling, if you can learn, if you want to learn how to wholesale, wholesale commercial property and wholesale uh, storage facilities, very, very lucrative. Um, and actually the marketing budget for wholesaling, my marketing budget for storage facilities to get out there and look for storage facilities, zero dollars, right? Whereas in like on the residential side, you spend in five, $10,000 to get all your deals done or whatever, right? And uh, on the commercial side, it's different. Right. You, when you learn how to wholesale property on the commercial side, your marketing budget is zero. OK. Um, uh, OK, good. Awesome. Any questions up until now? What documents we need to wholesale? You would basically you have to you have a, a you have you have to give all the information about the facility. Right. Um, and then you have to show like a pro forma with all the numbers and what is like, you know, what it's worth. Right. I mean, people are going to want to know, like, what's the cap rate? What's the cash on cash return? What's the ROI, et cetera. OK. And uh, and then like, you know, and all like pictures, like it's a whole presentation package is what it is, what you're going to be putting together. Everything and anything that you can possibly put into your because we need we need as much as we just need as much information as possible. We just do. Um, you know, to look at it and we'll sit there and we'll fine comb all that information. Okay. But yeah, so you need like all the numbers, the deal analysis, there's no comps. You don't do comps because in, in, in storage, there's no comps. Okay. It's all, it's income based is what it is. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Okay. So that is that. Now let's go back. Since we got, a, we got a few minutes left until the end of the webinar. What I want to do, if y'all are interested is like show you how to find self, find the hidden market. Would y'all be interested in finding some hidden market deals? While we're here, while we're here too, as well, 
Tell me of all of these five, which one relates to you the most? Which of these, like you're like, okay, like I'm very interested in this property, this type of property. Do you have, if you, do you have private money or do you know how to get private money, right? Do you have 20% to put down, right? That's income producing. Or do you have partners that can partner with you to do these deals? You know, are you interested in new construction? Are you interested in developing? What would you be interested in? Mismanaged, income producing, new construction, conversions, or wholesaling? Which one would it be? Okay, Lynn says, I'm really interested in mismanaged and new construction. Good. New construction and conversions. Who? Good else. What else? Opal says wholesaling. Awesome. Yeah, if you don't have any money, you're like, I ain't got no money. Then you got to wholesale. Wholesales, wholesaling is, is what you do when you first, I started, when I was first started, I started wholesaling back in the day. That's what I was doing, right? Okay, good. Patrick says income producing in California. Okay, good. Just got to have a lot of money or you got to know where to get a lot of money, right? For California, because everything's just so expensive over there. Not not, not doable, definitely not doable, but you just have to have money. But I would also just think if you're in California and you do have money to spend, highly recommend looking also into conversions, okay? Um, because you can really, you can really um, make some money on that as well too. Marvin says, mismanaged and wholesaling. Cool. Leon says, mismanaged and new construction. Okay, good. Awesome. I love it. I love it. All right. So there, as I said, there's so many different, the thing is, is that there's these five paths for you to go down. All right. And depending on which one that you go down, the funding is completely different for all of them. So everybody's like, how do you fund a deal? Well, what are you going to be buying? That's the question. So you reverse engineer. My personal opinion is what you should be doing is saying, look, I know I can come up with 20%. I know I can come up with $100,000. And I have a partner that can come up with $100,000. So together we have $200,000. Well, guess what? When you know how much money you can come up with, that gives you a base point, right? That gives you like a starting point for where you should be looking in this market. Okay, so if you can come up with, you know, $500,000 down, right, well, then you could be in like a lot of primary markets. If you can not only come up with $50,000 down, well, you know that you're going to be out in the tertiary markets, wherever you live. And so kind, kind, kind of reverse engineer, reverse engineer how much money you can come up with. Because the truth of the matter is, is in, in, uh, in commercial real estate, most of the time, most of the time you need money, especially your first deal, right? So now I own, you know, I own millions of dollars worth of uh, storage facilities. I haven't used my own money at all. I always use everybody else's money. I'm 100% privately funded. So I have not fund, fund, funded any of my deals. So totally doable for you not to have any money and still buy a storage facility. But what you have to do is you have to find other people that have money and use their money, okay? And, um, and so that's kind of how it works. Now, when you do that, a lot of times if I'm borrowing private money, I'm paying a higher interest rate when I borrow the private money. Now, what I could do is partner. I could partner and say, look, it's a 50-50 split. You bring me the money, I'll be, I'll, I'll be the boots on the ground as well too, okay? And you could do it like that as well too, and then you don't have to pay that high interest rate which is also a, a, a good deal as well, okay? All right, now let's get into the hidden markets and let's start looking at the hidden markets. This is the step-by-step -step process that I teach all my students all the time on how to find property, okay? And you do not, I'm gonna tell you right now, like I would say 95% of the time, you do not want to be going on to Crexy, LoopNet, MLS to find storage facilities. Just like you don't wanna be going there to look for anything else right now. Why? Because the prices are ridiculous. It's a seller's market on, on the MLS, in Crexy on loop neck it's it's considered a seller's market so for us as the buyers this is not the smartest way to find storage facilities okay 
the smartest way to find storage facilities is to go to the owner directly. Go to the owner directly. Okay. Now, um, so how you have to find storage facility owners that want to sell. Okay. Well, guess what? How many storage facilities are there in the United States? Did I tell you all this already? Do we have any guesses? How many storage facilities are there in the United States? Any guesses? Nine. That's like, I wish there were, that's nine. That's not enough. Nine, that is not a storage facility. Okay. 58,000, 70,000. I have no idea. Okay, good. Um, we got like the, the truth in one million. That's a lot of storage facilities. 500K, 49,000, 1 million. Okay. All right, so there are 50, around 50,000 storage facilities, okay? So if you think about it, that means that there's 1,000 storage facilities in every single state, right? Just, you know, kind of like average, right? 20% of those are owned by REITs, okay? 20% of those are owned by REITs. So that lead, you don't want to be contacting a REIT. What's a REIT? A REIT would be like, you know, hedge funds. So like Cube Smart and Public Storage and U-Haul and all these huge big companies, right? These big ones that are being built and stuff. Those are all essentially hedge funds. All right. So you just take those out, out of the thousand. That means that you have about seven to 800 storage facilities that are considered mom and pop shops per state. That's it. Seven to 800, right? My acquisitions person, I told him my job, his job is to find every single one of those 700 and talk to every single one of the owners, okay? So um, that's his job. And that's exactly what your job is, right? And that's exactly what your job is to find all those mom and pop shops and to talk to the owners, right? Okay, so what you can do, I'm going to give you some starting points. I'm going to give you some starting points, all right, just to get you started. Your homework until the next month when you come back to my, uh, to my class is to start looking for hidden storage facilities, okay? And I want to know if you find any, okay? You know, post it into the private Facebook group for the REI USA group, all right? And let me know and I can help you and guide you along the way. So the hidden market, number one, is you have to go to Google Maps, okay? Now, on Google Maps, all right, so essentially, has anybody ever tried to put a business on Google Maps before? Does anybody here have like an actual business they put on Google Maps, all right? As a storage facility owner, you, we have like, we have a checklist for our students, like you bought, a, you bought a storage facility, now what? And one of the things on our list, our checklist for our students is like, put your storage facility on Google Maps. It's like literally one of the first things that you have to do, okay? Now, a lot, nobody's put, nobody, like Alexis, there's like one, two people, there's only a couple people that have actually put a business on Google Maps. Guess what? It ain't easy, it ain't easy, okay? You have to get into Google business listings. You have to create an account. You have to put all the information about the company in. And then what they do is they mail you a postcard. On that postcard, you have like a code. You bring that code back and you put it into your account. Once they verify that code, then you get to actually post your business out to the world. And they're like super picky about all this stuff, okay? Guess what? All of these storage facility owners, all of these storage facility owners, I'm going to say, I'm going to guess 80% of the storage facility owners, there is no mailbox at that storage facility. No mailbox. Okay. So that means that they can't mail a postcard to their storage facility to get it onto Google Maps. And especially, and I'm talking about especially in the tertiary markets, when you get more into like primary, like, you know, everybody has a mailbox, secondary, a little bit less, right? But tertiary especially too. And when they, when you mail that postcard, 
then you're supposed to take that code and then put it into the thing and then it gets like put on into the world, right? So because everybody, when you're looking for something, you're essentially, when I search for something like a place, I'm just going on to Google Maps now. I just search storage facilities next near me, right? That's what people are doing. That's what you do now, right? So you have to get that facility on Google Maps, all right? But guess what? All these people that are owning all these storage facilities in the secondary and the tertiary markets, and they're 60, 70, 80 years old, they ain't going onto Google listings and listing their storage facility. Guess why? The storage facility that we just got under contract, the owner of that storage facility, he doesn't even own a computer. Doesn't even own a computer, okay? The, the $1.6 million storage facility that my student is buying right now, owner does not even own a computer. He does not even own a computer, okay? That, that facility was a hidden market facility, all right? So you need to find those storage facilities that are not on Google Maps, okay? Does that make sense? Say yes, I got it, I'm on it. I'm gonna be looking tonight, okay? But hell yeah, I'm gonna go out and buy me a storage. I'm gonna look for some storage facilities right now. Okay. Now, Google Maps is going to be when you go onto Google Maps, okay, and you look for storage facilities. There's like different levels on Google Maps too, right? Because guess what? You guys have never paid attention to this, a lot of y'all, right? But there's different levels of the Google Maps listing. So then like, let's just say they happen to get it on Google Maps. Somehow they got it on Google Maps, right? Which just happens a lot. Like you'll see a storage facility on Google Maps. It is like the completely wrong address, okay? Or you'll see it on Google Maps and it's there, but there's no other information. Right, or it's there and like the phone number is correct, but there's no website or all the mixes and matches of all of that of what I'm saying is that is that sometimes they get onto Google Maps, but the information is not there and correct. And those are also leads because that means that they don't have an office manager. If they have an office manager then somebody can be taking care of that. And guess what? When you call them to talk to them, guess who's gonna answer the phone? The office manager. And you'd be like, hi, my name is Stacy, and I'm gonna buy your storage facility. Do you think your owner would sell it? Can I talk to him? And guess what they're gonna say? No, they're gonna say no. Why, why are they gonna say no? My, my, my owner doesn't, the owner does not wanna sell. Very rarely do you ever talk to an owner, like, a, like a, a manager of a facility. It does happen, but very rarely do you talk to a manager of a facility and they say, oh yeah, you know what? I really do think he wants to sell. Let me just, let me just give you his phone number. Let me patch you through over here so you can talk to him, okay? Rarely ever does that happen. So you don't want to talk to any facilities that, you know, um, have office managers or what I do is we'll just like send them a letter or something like this. Like we'll keep sending them letters and stuff. But um, most of the time, if it's an office manager, then like, they're just like, they don't want to help you at all. Cause they don't want to lose their job. They don't want to lose their job. Okay. So you're going to, when you're going on the Google maps, start paying attention to those descriptions because that's going to be the first step. All right. And then what you're going to do is you're going to map out all the storage facilities that are not that are wrong on Google Maps that are the descriptions are wrong, phone number, no website. You're going to map those out and then you're going to get out, you're going to map it out and you're going to drive for storage. Hashtag drive for storage. Okay, and you're going to post out that you're driving for storage facilities and then tag me in it and let me know that you're driving for storage. Okay, and you'll be driving around and I'm going to tell you, you're going to go to all those facilities that you find on Google Maps that are kind of sort of leads. And then guess what? For every one of those facilities that you found on Google Maps, they're going to be a storage facility that's right across the street that is not on Google Maps, right? 
So driving for storage is one of the best ways to find the hidden market, all right? And that is what your homework is for the next month, is to get out, to look for store, like to go onto Google Maps, look for storage facilities, and just get out there and start driving. And get out there and start driving, okay? And see what is out there. I'm telling you, we do this on a regular, on a quarterly basis. We take an entire weekend and we drive the entire weekend. We drove just that my, I don't, my, my acquisitions person does it now. So he went out driving just like two or three weeks ago. He drove like 16 hours, like in, in like a weekend. He found like 20 or 25 facilities, not on the maps. And we have one under contract right now from that. Okay. And also right before Thanksgiving, we drove around Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We found like 30, 30 to 40 facilities and we got three under contract. One of them I put under contract right that weekend. The owner was like, I need to sell this now. Yes. And I was like, this is my price. I'll sell. He said, I'll take it. Okay. And so that is driving. That's finding the hidden storage facilities and contacting those facilities. Um, and that's how you find the best deals. The best deals. Now that's just one itty bitty micro step and a whole long line of steps of what you got to do, all right? But at least it makes you aware of what the process is to find the best deals. And this is a great way if you want to be a wholesaler, this is a great way to find the best deals. Actually, this is the way you have to find deals because this is it, right? Okay, any questions on that? That is your homework for this month. Can y'all get out there for me and start driving for storage and then come back next month and then we'll meet. And if you find any storage facilities that like go out and just have like no expectations, just go out there and look and start. And when you're driving around, like you ain't like jamming out. You ain't be like, yo, 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 what's up? It's like, you have to be quiet. You have to be focused because I'm telling you these storage facilities are literally hidden. All right. I've picked up abandoned storage facilities this way. I've picked up, you know, all every type of storage facilities you can find. I've picked it up, but I ha you have to be focused, okay? And guess what? You can go out and you can buy a list of storage facilities, but I can guarantee you that you sit there and mail out letters to a storage facility, they're not gonna contact you. It's like very difficult because these storage facility owners, these owners, in these secondary and tertiary markets, guess what? They're just like you and me, all right? And they just, and they're 60, 70, 80 years old. I just closed on one. He was like 84 years old. He could barely even walk. He just, uh, all we did, this is the one that I closed right on. We were driving for, driving for storage and I put it under contract that day. He just wanted me to come to his house and sit and talk to him. That's what he wanted. And he said, he's like, I get calls all the time, people that want to buy my storage facility. He's like, I get letters all the time. He said, but nobody ever wanted to come over to my house and just have a cup of coffee with me. And I'm going to tell y'all, that's how it is in the storage investing world to get the best deals. Because guess, guess what? I bought that one and I'm going to double that in the next two years. And I'm going to make like 300 grand on that thing in like the next year or two. All right. Okay, so uh, so anyways, any questions on that? I don't know what else to say. What are y'all thinking? Y'all can do it. Y'all excited? Y'all can do this? Driving for storage? All right. So please, please, please check out um, REI USA. This is an REI USA storage facility. REI USA webinar. And I am just one of a plethora of amazing teachers. If you want to learn any type of real estate transaction, think of REI USA as like a community college for real estate investors. You're just like, I know I want to get into real estate investing. I have no idea what to do, how to do it. Why don't you just go and put yourself in front of all these amazing investors, learn about all the transactions. And then after a month or two, you're kind of like, oh yeah, I kind of really want to do land. Or I do want to do storage. Or I do want to do, you know, tax liens or whatever, you know? So, um, so that is what that is what uh, REI USA is. So please check us out completely free to try us out and then join us. And then next month, come to mind and y'all tell me what you found. 
Okay. And if you are, if there's no replay to this unless you are an REI USA member. All REI USA members get access to all the replays. But um, if you're not a member, you don't get access to the replay. Okay. All right. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. And I will see you guys at the next training. All right. Take care.